I have to say you guys that I'm extremely excited for today's video as you guys know if you follow the channel the Beatles are my favorite band of all time thus I believe they have the greatest discography ever actually this was supposed to be a cheer list video however I, as I was making the video and I was taking the notes I realized that most of the albums actually pretty much all of them ranked in the A and S tier so that would kind of look silly for a video so I decided to do a worst to best reviewing and ranking every single one of the studio releases yes including Yellow Submarine I actually was kind of surprised. I found myself being very critical about many of these albums when I was writing the notes. I often write like a little script that I have on the side to make sure I don't get off topic when I'm recording the video. And I wasn't all praise, you know, so if you think this is going to be just me praising the Beatles for the entirety of the video, not really. I'm going to be very honest about my opinion on a lot of these records. However, because it's the Beatles, I have to make sure you guys understand that just because I put an album at number 12, 10, or 9, or even 5, it doesn't mean that it's a bad album. Almost every single release by the Beatles is above average, including Yellow Submarine, you know, so even if it's slow, it's still a great album and I'll make sure to make that clear when I'm reviewing the record, okay? I also want to make sure that you guys understand that this is only my personal opinion, so if you have your own, and I'm pretty sure you do, go ahead and leave it down below in the comments and I'll make sure to read it and give you my opinion on your opinion. I don't want to make this intro too long, so let's just go on with number 13. You and I both know that this album was going to be last, I mean, it's the most underwhelming release by the Beatles after the White Album, which is one of the greatest albums of all time, if not the greatest, and we'll get to that in a minute, to release a soundtrack where only half of the songs are actually Beatles song and the rest is just a bunch of instrumentals by George Martin. Even if the instrumentals are good and are enjoyable, they're really pretty in my opinion, it's still very, very underwhelming and uh, I don't think it represents the Beatles discography very well, so even if this album could be or has the potential of being more enjoyable in terms of overall enjoyability, you know, and uh, the sound of the record with songs like Only a Northern Song, All Too Much, Hey Bulldog, All You Need Is Love, it has a pretty impressive first half. Because of how weirdly placed it is inside the band's discography, you know, in between the White Album and Abbey Road, everyone thinks this to be the worst album, including myself. However, I do know that there's a lot of people who are a fan of the Beatles that haven't even given this album a try, and I don't think that's the right thing to do either. I think you'd find this album to be very enjoyable you know again it has a pretty strong first half and the second half it's a bunch of instrumentals but really enjoyable as well it's beautiful theatrical and classical George Martin is an amazing musician as well so I don't think you should skip this album by any means but inside the band's discography it's clearly the least significant album so it lands in number 13 let's go on with number 12. I know a lot of you are going to kill me for putting this album here but I have to make sure you guys understand as starting from this point for me at least every single album here is a above average is remarkable is amazing whether the Beatles is the follow-up to the band's first album please please me and much like that album it has both original songs and covers it has some of my favorite songs from the Beatlemania era like all I've got to do all my loving hold me tied not a second time Paul McCartney was on point in terms of performance throughout this whole album his performance of till there was you is one of the most beautiful pieces of music the Beatles ever offered my main issue with this album is that some of the songs here can feel feel a little bit like filler. For example, the Ringo Starr's horrible performance of I Wanna Be Your Man is one of the worst Beatles songs out there, if not the worst. It's claustrophobic, it's tacky, it's very aggressively produced. I mean, there's nothing good about that track. I know a lot of people like it, but in my opinion, even for Ringo, it's a terrible performance. Then you also have Roll Over Beethoven by George Harrison. It's a terrible cover as well. He just doesn't have the energy to perform such a track, at least at that point in the Beatles discography you know so there's quite a few songs here that make the overall enjoyability of the record suffer a little this was just a clear attempt to make a second please please me and even though for the most part it nails it you know it's in the little things that it doesn't do right that you know lands the album at the 12th spot also there is a fact that it has you was released that is 10 times better in the form of meet the beatles so yeah this album is just not really bad it's a great album again i think it's above average of everything that was being released in the 60s but it, in Inside the band's discography is kind of underwhelming. For a lot of you, putting Beatles for sale above with the Beatles is a criminal offense, but here's the thing, when it comes to the Beatlemania albums, the driving factor for me is how enjoyable they are. And inside the band's discography, there's only a few albums that I find as enjoyable as Beatles for sale. The funny thing is the fact that I believe that this is one of the most mediocre releases by the band. You know, there's nothing going on in this album that hinted towards the future of the band. The only thing that you can kind of say that was meaningful about this record 
his songs like I'm a Loser by John Lennon, for example, that hinted towards the Dylan-esque style of songwriting he was going to adopt in albums like Help and Rubber Soul. But apart from that, the only thing I can say that's positive about this record is how enjoyable every single song in here is. Words of Love, Eight Days a Week, Mr. Moonlight, one of the greatest performances by John Lennon. What an incredible, filled with passion and just power. I've probably heard this album many more times than a lot of albums above it, you know, and Paul McCartney, by the way, has some of the greatest vocal performances of his career on this record in the form of Long Tall Sally and Kansas City. For anyone that believes that Paul McCartney is not a good singer or is not one of the greatest singers of all time, please listen to this song. No Reply is still one of the strongest openers from any Beatlemania era album, you know, and overall, when I look at this album, I just see a set of enjoyable pieces that truly marked the point where the band was kind of getting tired of the Beatlemania rush and jumped into more complex songwriting, you know, and I think that's significant in and of itself. It stays in number 11 because the albums above it had more meaningful moments for the band's evolution, but it's still a great album, so yeah. Let's go on with number 10. A lot of people call this album the black sheep of the psychedelic era of the band, you know, but as Sgt. Pepper loses credibility in the music industry, this album gains it because the track list is very impressive. The songs like Hello, Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, two of the best songs the band ever produced, All You Need Is Love, Blue AJ, in my opinion, the best psychedelic song George Harrison ever wrote. It's very clear that the band still had a lot left in the tank after Sgt. Pepper's. The main issue with this album would be the fact that this record doesn't really make sense at times. The first half of the record is the original songs made for the soundtrack, and then the second half of the album is just a bunch of singles that were not previously released, like All You Need Is Love, Hello Goodbye, Penny Lane, and all these other tracks. And uh, well, that violates a rule the band had at the time of not releasing singles on albums. It also creates this disconnect between side one and side two that doesn't really feel too good when you're listening to the album. I mean, it's obvious that the second half is way better than the first, and that doesn't really Really. That's never too good when you're listening to an album. It's not me saying the first half is bad. Again, songs like Your Mother Should Know, The Fall on the Hill, and Blue Way Jay are extremely, extremely good. But the fact that the first half is way weaker than the second clearly creates this unbalance in the album that makes the album fall to number 10. You know, it feels like a compilation rather than an actual album. That's why it's so low. But it's still a very good record, and you definitely should give it a chance. Don't believe all the people that say that this is just a bunch of B-sides to Sgt. Pepper's. That's not really the case. It's just a bunch of singles and a bunch of songs that were made for the Magical Mystery Tour movie, and that's perfectly fine. This album is probably one of the most significant records in music history. There's a lot of stories surrounding the creation of this album, but probably the most remarkable one is the fact that it was recorded in one 12-hour session in just a single day, 585 minutes, where the Beatles created one of the greatest debut albums of all time. Even though it's at number 9, the amount of times I've listened to this album is ridiculous. It's one of the most enjoyable albums of all time, and actually, Actually, if you have a friend who doesn't know the Beatles and you want to introduce the formula of the Beatles to them, play this album. Don't play Abbey Road, don't play Rubber Soul, don't play Revolver. Play Please Please Me because this is the birth of one of the greatest discographies of all time and that is the best introduction someone can have to the Beatles. It has some of the best original tracks by the band in the form of I Saw Her Standing There, P.S. I Love You, Please Please Me, Love Me Do, and the covers fit really well with the original material and I go to him. Maybe it's you, Twist and Shout, the album flows pretty well and that is the reason why it falls in number 9. I put it above albums like Magical Mystery Tour, for example, that a lot of you may argue that it has more meaningful moments in terms of the band's evolution as songwriters, mainly because of what it meant for the band and as I said before, in terms of the Beatlemania albums, the driving factor is enjoyability and this is one of the most enjoyable Beatles albums. So it falls in number 9, let's go on with number 8. This album should be higher. I'm not too pleased with the placement of this record, but honestly, when I was reviewing Viewing every single album, I couldn't really put it any higher, but believe me, the songwriting, the production, the energy of this album, and how meaningful it was for the band's discography qualify this record to be higher. It's just that it was impossible for me to do that. It is the first time the band ever delivered a fully original set of songs, and believe me, these are some of the best songs from the Beatlemania years. Tell Me Why, Can't Buy Me Love, the title track, Hard Day's Night, I mean, every single song here that that relies on the Beatlemania rush is excellent, fun, exciting. This album is as enjoyable as Please Please Me, but it lands a little higher because it also has tracks like And I Love Her, 
and If I Fail, songs that show a more mature and romantic side to the band. This was groundbreaking back in the day. It was not normal seeing a rock and roll artist release a song like And I Love Her, and the only reason why I can't put this album higher is because the albums that are above it were more significant for the band's development, you know, meant more, had more moments that hinted towards the greatness the band reached in the late 60s. But if I had it my way and I could place more than five albums in the top five, this would definitely be one of those records. Extremely, extremely enjoyable. The peak of Beatlemania, in my opinion, and an album that falls at number eight. Let's go on with number seven. For a lot of people, this was the last Beatlemania album, and it's easy to understand why. I mean, right after this album, we have Rubber Soul, and it has songs like Ticket to Ride, Dizzy Mr. Lissy, Another Girl. But in my opinion, this album is way more than that. This was the prelude to the greatest creative outburst in the history of music. Right after this record was released, Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper's, The White Album, Abbey Road happened, you know, and that's no coincidence. A lot of the ideas that were explored in this album in the form of Help, for example, which was way darker and more personal type of lyric that John Lennon had not done before. The same thing with You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, a folk tune that resembles the songwriting style of Bob Dylan, a great inspiration for John Lennon. George Harrison proved that he was an incredible songwriter too with the track I Need You, which is one of my favorite Beatle ballads, and that the release of Yesterday is just one of the most significant moments in rock history because, again, it's not normal for a rock and roll artist to release a song like And I Love Her. So when Paul McCartney released a song that was just him and his guitar in an album that also has songs like, again, There's a Mr. Lizzie, Help, but You're Gonna Lose That Girl, Ticket to Ride, it was groundbreaking, you know, it was not normal seeing that sort of shift inside of an album. Maybe on its own, it sounds like just another Beatlemania record, but when you understand where the album falls inside the band's catalog, inside the band's canon, when you read the story of what was happening behind the scenes in this album, you know, the band were, were getting kind of tired of touring, they wanted to experiment more in the studio, but because they had to perform the tracks live, they couldn't really do it. When you understand the whole process of the creation of this record, it's pretty obvious that this album was more significant than A Hard Day's Night, and that is the reason why it falls in number seven. I feel like this album is overlooked by people that are still heard about the band's breakup. This album finds itself at the very end of a streak of albums that changed the music forever, so I understand that at first glance it can be a little underwhelming, but that is exactly what this album was meant to be. The band was tired of all the experimentation, they were tired of being a studio band, and they decided to go back to their roots performing an album that's basically live, you know, it's a live album recorded in the studio. And for the most part, I think they succeeded. I mean, we're looking at an incredible track list here where even though they were trying to do old fashioned rock music, sometimes masterpieces filter through the track list in the form of Across the Universe. For example, one of my favorite pieces by John Lennon with incredible production by Phil Spector. I hope Paul McCartney's not listening right now. Paul McCartney was writing some of his best songs in this album. I've Got a Feeling, Get Back, One After 909, Two of Us. A song that saw the Lennon and McCartney doing singing in harmony once again after I think it was three or four years. George Harrison doesn't stay behind offering his most sophisticated song in my opinion with I Me Mine, a song that's supposed to make fun of the fact that you know the egos were overtaking the band's creative vein and were just causing this massive tension in the recording sessions. The title track is one of the most recognizable, celebrated, and popular songs of all time and you know man, even if we're not seeing anything but the husk of what the Beatles once were, it's clear that they're not working together anymore. It's, still, it's clear that they wanted to go in different directions creatively. For me, this album ended up exactly as it was supposed to, the sound of the greatest band of all time falling apart. While sad, it's undeniable that it gives this timeless feel to it that almost lands the album inside the top five. So yeah, number six, great record, overlooked in my opinion, overhated. Let's go on with number five. Now the next five albums we'll be talking about on this video are some of the most celebrated albums ever made, some of the greatest achievements in music history. So once again, if you disagree, you don't need to get angry, you just need to put your own list down. Down below. Because at number five, I'm going to put Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. For decades, this album was seen as the greatest achievement in music history, and it's easy to understand why. If you're as young as I am, it's probably really hard to imagine how groundbreaking this album was, but I mean, the colorful instrumentation, the idea of narrative leading the album's lyrics, the psychedelic elements, and a bunch of recording techniques that made the fans feel like it came from another planet, at least, you know, back then. Nowadays, with 
so much more music being released and so many people being inspired by the likes of albums like Sgt. Peppers, it's kind of hard to imagine and it can feel a little bit underwhelming. I understand that. Especially because streaming gave us the opportunity to hear albums before Sgt. Peppers that had the same psychedelic elements, similar recording techniques. I mean, it's pretty clear that the Beatles were not the first to use this type of style or this type of sound. However, they were clearly among the best when it comes to the use of this sound, you know? The album's legend kind of fell off a little, you know, as people started to see albums like Abbey Road and Revolver as more groundbreaking than Sgt. Pepper's. Now don't get me wrong, this album still should be ranked among the greatest albums ever made. It's truly a remarkable album, incredibly influential actually. There's an argument to be made that this was the most influential album in the band's catalog. Songs like Losing the Sky with Diamonds with a little help of my friend, the title track Lovely Rita when I'm 64, so many great examples of the band at their peak. And the fact that it has probably the best piece of music the Beatles ever produced in the form of A Day in the Life, a song that transcends music and becomes art itself, and you have a great album in your hands. The reason why I don't put it at number one or in the top three even is mainly because songs like Good Morning, Good Morning, Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, and Within You Without You make the pace of the album feel kind of tanky. I don't know, I feel like those songs could have been replaced with tracks like Pain Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever, songs that were designed to be part of Sgt. Pepper's, you know. Those songs don't really match the quality of the rest of the album. So when you're listening to the greatest achievement in music history, you expect every single track to be excellent, and that is not the case with those tracks I mentioned. It's still great, you know. Number five in the greatest discography of all time is still a pretty good spot. However, it's true that in my opinion, the legend of this album was kind of exaggerated. It's a 10, it's a great album, I'm on the greatest ever. I don't know how many times I've said that about this album, honestly, but I want to make sure you guys understand that even though it's only a number Number five, I still believe it's one of the most groundbreaking albums ever made, and I still think the music wouldn't look the same without Sgt. Pepper. So yeah, number five, great album, love it. Let's go on with number four. The true final Beatles album. Believe it or not, even though Let It Be was released in 1970 and Abbey Road was released in 1969, the recording sessions for this album actually took place after the ones from Let It Be, called the Get Back Sessions. This is the last set of songs the band ever wrote together, and in terms of production, this is probably one of the most prolific albums ever made. It's remarkable that it was released in 1969 and it still has better production than many albums in the current era of music, you know. Paul's bass playing in this album is incredibly good. I mean, there's YouTube videos that isolated Paul's bass throughout the entire record and they have millions of views. It has the best opening sequence out of any Beatles album with Come Together, one of the best tracks by John Lennon, and a track that confirmed that George Harrison was a powerhouse in terms of songwriting with something, the most beautiful ballad the Beatles ever produced. Here Comes the Sun is another example of George Harrison being an absolute genius when it comes to songwriting in this album and both Paul and John were also doing some incredible things with songwriting. Paul arranged the whole Abbey Road Mitley which was a set of individual songs that worked as a single track and though things like this were already done in the past by people like The Who for example in their album from 1967 The Who Sellout, the Abbey Road Mitley is still one of the earliest and most prolific examples of a Mitley being used in an album you know and when it comes to John he was on point in many of these tracks. Song Songs like Because and Sun King showed his ability to create harmonies, Come Together is one of his best songs, and then you have the atomic bomb called I Want You She's So Heavy. John literally pioneered an entire new branch of rock music with only one song. This is one of his best songs actually, I would go as far as to say my favorite song on the entire Abbey Road album. Golden Slumbers and Carry That Way is still one of the most epic moments inside the band's discography, and when you look at this album and you look at the great achievement it was for the band, it's kind of ironic that this was their last attempt to create a record. It's true that the band had a lot more chemistry when the recording of this album happened because they knew they were going to break up after it, so I guess that gave them like the relief they needed in order to make an album as a band again, knowing it was going to be the last created this air of nostalgia inside the recordings. There's very few albums out there that match the quality of this record. You know, don't think just because this is a number four, it's not a masterpiece or it's only above average. This is still one of the greatest releases of all time, and if anyone goes out there and says this is the greatest Beatles album, figuratively, I kind of agree. You'll probably cringe when I say this, but for me, this 
is the biggest change of sounds the Beatles ever showed. For many of you, that's probably Revolver or Sgt. Pepper's, but this album came at a time where the Beatles were still seen as a rock and roll band. Of course, tracks like Yesterday and I Love Her and many of the other songs I mentioned prior in this video showed that the band had hints of being something greater than just a rock band. However, it was Rubber Soul that capitalized on that and made sure everyone knew the Beatles were here to create something bigger than just rock music, actually something bigger than just music. It was in this album that a lot of the band's future ideas were first seen. For example, Norwegian Wood was the first time we saw uh, George Harrison's fascination for Indian music. In My Life, apart from being one of the most loved and celebrated songs by the band, was also extremely influential for the Baroque scene in the 60s. It felt like John Lennon's songwriting aged 10 years in just a few months when you compare songs like Girl and Nowhere Man to the songs he was doing just a couple months prior in albums like Help and Hard Day's Night. You know, it's so remarkable and so impressive that just two years prior to the release of these albums, they were doing Please Please Me and With the Beatles and Beatles for Sale, and now they were revolutionizing the world of music. The production and recording was also miles above everything they've done before. It was their inability to recreate the songs in their live performances that gave birth to the idea of being a studio band, and that essentially ended up in albums like Revolver and Sgt. Pepper's. For many, this was the first modern album ever made, you know, creating a concept where the non-singles got the same amount of attention as the singles, in turn inspiring people like Brian Wilson to create albums like Pet Sounds. This album is the beginning of the Beatles as the greatest band of all time. It has some of my favorite songs like Drive My Car, Think For Yourself, If I Needed Someone, Michelle, so many great songs in this record, honestly, that it's hard to believe that just a year prior, once again, I know I said that before, but once again, just a year prior, they were doing help, and now they're creating such a masterpiece of an album, you know, and that is the reason why I believe it's better than Abbey Road, I believe it's more meaningful than Abbey Road, and that it's why it's number three. As I said just a minute ago, Rubber Soul was the beginning of something new. Revolver is a result of that awakening. When they decided to stop touring, they were not restrained anymore. They could create music that was not suited for live performances, resulting in an album with the most interesting and inventive songwriting the world has ever seen. Since I truly believe the Revolver is both sonically and conceptually the most interesting release by the band, it's kind of hard for me not to put it at number one. Every single idea by the band resulted in a song. Paul's fascination for classical music led to the creation of Eleanor Rigby. John was amazed by in-studio experimentations and that resulted in the shiny acoustics of I'm Only Sleeping. He also contributed to the psychedelic scene with the amazing Tomorrow Never Knows. You have George Harrison opening up the album with the politically charged Tax Man. In an album filled with experimentation, Paul made sure to add that melodic side that the Beatles were known for in songs like Good Day Sunshine, Got to Get You Into My Life, and also one of his most beautiful and celebrated songs, The Lullaby by here there and everywhere even Ringo has a great song here in the form of Yellow Submarine you know it does have a few moments where the quality of the album is kind of questionable especially Love You Too I do love George Harrison's fascination for Indian music but he took it a little bit too far in this one it doesn't really match the energy of you know the rest of the album there's also the track I want to tell you that even though I think it's really enjoyable I don't think it's at the same level of quality as songs like Dr. Robert She Said She Said but apart from this this few moments is very clear that the Beatles were far above everyone else at the time, at least in terms of creativity, and that is the reason why I should put this album at number one, but I won't. And the main reason is, well, you'll see. I don't think I've ever talked about this album in my channel before. I've mentioned it definitely. If you follow my channel, you probably know that for me, this is by a mile, by a long mile, the greatest piece of music ever made. But I never really explained why. And here's the thing: for me, this can hardly be called a Beatles album. For me, this is a Paul McCartney, John Lennon. George Harrison and Ringo album. Everyone was kind of doing their own thing, which is why this album is so long compared to the rest. You know, there simply was too much material that they couldn't exclude because it was so great. And because that's the case, I think the best way to explain my fascination for this album would be going one by one, starting by Ringo, the least impressive Beatle on this album. But still, some of my favorite moments by him are found in this album. Don't Pass Me By, in my opinion, is a lovely song. Then you have Good Night, a great way to close the album. Great vocal performance, too. With Ringo, I don't really 
know if he doesn't know how to sing or he doesn't want to. His drumming is a crucial part of every single song on this album except the ones where he didn't participate like uh, Back in the USSR or acoustic tracks like Blackbeard and I Will. The fact that he was able to keep up with this tsunami of ideas from John, George and Paul was impressive in its own right. You know, he was definitely a key part of the greatness of this album. George was sitting on a pile of tracks that he wanted to release as soon as he left the band in the form of the album All Things Must Pass, his first release after going solo. That didn't really stop him from giving us some of his best material on this record though because the track While My Guitar Gently Weeps is one of the most celebrated songs by the band. Incredible guitar playing by Eric Clapton that adds this layer of blues that fits really well into the melancholic uh, and you know philosophical lyrics of the track. Long 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 is another highlight for me, one of my favorite songs on the record. Beautiful, intimate, personal. It's basically like a love song to God, whoever that is for him and honestly it's one of the most beautiful moments on the whole record. Paul had multiple faces on this album. He could be an old-fashioned romantic in tracks like Martha My Dear, I Will, and Honey Pie. Creatively playful in songs like Obla Dio Obla Da and Rocket Raccoon, but also an absolute chaos machine in songs like Why Don't We Do It On The Road and Helter Skelter. There's many other sides to him on this album. You know, Blackbird, for example, a song made in support of the civil rights movement would be one of them, but talking about all of them could be a video on its own, so I'm just gonna continue to John. He was the most notable Beatle here, you know. There's not a single song on this record that could be called a typical John Lennon song, you know. Every single song in here was an attempt to create a new style of music or to experiment with a new style of music. The deeply personal Julia, the euphoric nature of everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. I can't even begin to describe the acceleration of that track. Our first share of beautiful pieces like Cry Baby Cry or Dear Prudence, one of the most beautiful songs he ever wrote. I mean, he was on point in every single track on this record. Sexy Sadie's and Lyric Sample, really good ballad. And believe me, you know, this is only the beginning. Listening to this album is getting lost in a world of ideas that normally wouldn't work together. This album was this close to being a disaster, to being an absolute mess. But something happened, you know, something clicked. And it's that something that clicked that made this album the greatest of all time. If the runtime of this album scares you a little bit, that's normal and it's totally understandable. You know, going from 40 minutes to an hour and a half can be kind of like a lot, but I can confidently say that I'm not the same man I was before listening to this album. It changed my life. It's the reason why I started this channel. It's the reason why I started to listen to so much music. You know, I had an epiphany when I heard this record. I started to listen to as much music as I possibly could, trying to find another album that gave me the same feeling that this record gave me when I heard it for the first time. It changed my mind on what was achievable through music, and it is because of this that it sits at the very top, not only of this list, but the entire history of music. However, that is only my personal opinion. If you have your own, and I'm pretty sure you do, once again, leave it down below in the comments and I'll make sure to read it and give you my opinion on your opinion. I want you guys to give me your own list. I'm really excited to see what you guys think of my list. I'm very confident with the list I put together. This truly represents my opinion on every single Beatles album. You know, I would swap a few places depending on my mood. Sometimes I think that A Hard Day's Night is a better album that helps. Sometimes I think that Abbey Road was more significant than Rubber Soul, but for the most part, this list does represent my feeling on the band's discography and that's the reason why I want to see your own list. So make sure to leave it down below in the comments. I truly hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any other videos that I upload. I've been recording for an hour and 45 minutes. This is probably going to be a juggernaut of a video. So if you want me to talk about any other topics related to music, if you want me to check out a song, album, or artist, go ahead and leave it down below as well. And I'll make sure to read it and for your requests as soon as I can. Once again, I hope that you guys enjoyed and I hope that I can see you soon with a new video. But until then, bye.